Hi, and welcome back to my channel, Learning Biology with Dr. Vanessa. In today's video, we are going to be talking about capillaries and capillary exchange. What are these tiny vessels and why are they so important in exchange of substances between blood and tissue? What are capillaries? Capillaries are the smallest of blood vessels that are about five to 10 micrometers in diameter. Their primary function is to exchange substances between the blood and interstitial fluid, which is the fluid between tissues and cells. Unlike their counterparts, they are very simple. Again, they are the smallest of blood vessels in diameter, and they are also very simple, only containing an endothelium and basement membrane layer. Before we talk about how capillaries exchange substances, let's talk about the three different types of capillaries that are found in the body. There are three different types of capillaries, continuous, fenestrated, and sinusoidal. Let's take a closer look at the differences between these three types of capillaries and where they are found in the body. In continuous capillaries, the endothelial cells form a continuous tube. The basement membrane is also completely intact. These types of capillaries are found in the brain, lungs, skeletal and smooth muscle, and connective tissues. Fenestrated capillaries have fenestrations in the endothelial layer. So in this case, these fenestrations or pores are about 70 to 100 nanometers in diameter. So now there's some openings within um, the endothelial layer. However, the basement membrane is still um, completely intact. And so in this type of capillary, more could pass through versus continuous capillaries. These types of capillaries are found in the kidneys, villi of the small intestine, choroid plexus of the brain, ciliary processes of the eye, and in endocrine glands. Sinusoidal capillaries, as you see here, are going to be the type of capillaries that allow the most to pass through. In the um, endothelial layer, you see there's very large fenestrations, much larger holes than we saw in fenestrated capillaries. The other thing that you'll notice is that the basement membrane is not uh, intact at all. It's actually incomplete or sometimes it's completely absent depending on where it is. So now this is going to allow the most of things to pass through um, with these capillaries. They can allow proteins to pass through and sometimes even cells. For example, um, these types of capillaries allow red blood cells to enter the bloodstream via sinusoids of red bone marrow. So these are going to allow a lot more. We find these types of capillaries in the liver, spleen, anterior pituitary, and parathyroid glands, also within um, the red bone marrow as well. In order for capillaries to function efficiently, they form capillary beds, also known as microcirculation. Microcirculation is a network that can include 10 to 100 capillaries. They connect to arterial flow and venous return. So blood coming in um, on the artery side that is oxygenated with um, nutrients and then blood coming out that now has um, carbon dioxide and wastes in it going back to the heart. So we've talked about capillaries and how they're the smallest of the blood vessels and very unique in that they can allow this exchange of fluid or substances, depending on what type of capillaries they are, they can allow more to go in and out of the capillary as well. And these are really important because this is where the exchange of substances is going to occur. So arterial blood will flow and get smaller and smaller end up in the capillary beds, and then go back out um, for venous return. The mission of the cardiovascular system is to keep blood flowing through these capillaries to allow for capillary exchange. So what is capillary exchange? It is the movement of substances between the blood 
and interstitial fluid. And this happens um, through three basic methods that we're going to be discussing in detail. These methods include diffusion, transcytosis, and bulk flow. Diffusion is the most important method used um, when substances are entering and leaving the capillaries. In diffusion, substances are going to move down their concentration gradient. What that means is that substances are going to move from higher concentration to lower concentration. If you remember from your studies before, this is a passive process and is the easiest way for substances to move. Imagine diffusion as this. You spray a spritz of perfume or cologne in the corner of a room. That is where it's going to be at its highest concentration. In the rest of the room, it's at basically zero concentration, but the perfume or cologne will start to diffuse through the room in such that if other people are in the room, they will start to smell it as it diffuses throughout the room. So it's going from that very high concentrated area where it was just sprayed and it's starting to slowly diffuse out into the room um, where others would be able to smell it. And also it's going from that higher concentration to that lower concentration, the path of least resistance. When blood gets down to the tissues, it is going to, the blood portion is going to have higher concentrations of things like oxygen and nutrients and lower concentrations of carbon dioxide and other wastes. And so when um, that blood gets to the tissues, oxygen is going to come off from those red blood cells and diffuse into the interstitial fluid and eventually be, be taken up by the cells to be able to use, be used. And carbon dioxide is going to come as a waste product back into the blood. Again, higher concentration of carbon dioxide would be on the tissue side and it would diffuse back into the blood. So oxygen would diffuse into the interstitial fluid, carbon dioxide would diffuse back into the blood, nutrients would diffuse into the tissue because they're going to be at higher concentration in the blood, and then other wastes um, would diffuse into the blood to be taken out of the body. In transcytosis, and there's a couple different types of transcytosis where you have receptor mediated or absorptive transcytosis. But in either one, the main process is that substances in the blood plasma are going to become enclosed within pinocytotic vesicles that can enter endothelial cells by endocytosis and leave by exocytosis. So they'll be taken in um, into these vesicles that pinch off and are part of the plasma membrane, and then they are uh, transferred to the other side um, by exocytosis and releasing of that vesicle. This is important mainly for large lipid insoluble molecules that cannot cross capillary walls by any other way. An example of these would include insulin and some antibodies that pass from mom to fetus. Bulk flow is a passive process, just like diffusion, but in this case, it is where a large number of ions, molecules, or particles in a fluid are going to move together in the same direction. Bulk flow, large number moving together in the same direction. In this case, it's going to occur from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure. Bulk flow is more important for the regulation of relative volumes of blood and interstitial fluid. In order to understand bulk flow, we need to talk about a variety of different pressures that are going to be present now in these capillary beds where movement of fluid is flowing in to the tissues, from the blood to the tissues, and then from the tissues to the blood. Now, when I say tissues, we're really talking about that interstitial fluid. So when you think about tissues, tissues are made up of cells, and those cells are combined together to make up different tissues, and different tissues make organs. But between 
uh, the cells in between the tissues, there's this fluid. So what has to happen is things are going to move from the blood to this fluid and then be taken up by the cells. And then it's going to move from the cells to the fluid and then be taken up by the blood. So that's what we're referring to when we talk about this interstitial fluid. So two main pressures that are going to be present are filtration, which is the pressure driven uh, this is the pressure driven movement from the capillaries into the interstitial fluid. So movement from the blood to the interstitial fluid is known as filtration, where reabsorption is going in the opposite direction. So reabsorption is going to be the pressure driven movement from interstitial fluid into capillaries. So the movement of that fluid back into the capillaries from the interstitial fluid is known as reabsorption. So when we talk about bulk flow, we're going to be talking about the pressures that are happening on the arterial end of the capillaries and the venule end of the capillaries. So remember from the arteries, we're getting oxygen rich, nutrient rich blood. And that's so this con the content of this blood is going to be high in oxygen, high in nutrients. And as things are going to pass from the capillaries to the interstitial fluid, that's going to change to where now the blood returning in the veins are going to have less oxygen, less nutrients, and more things like carbon dioxide and wastes on that side. So there's going to be driving pressures that are going to be happening in the interstitial fluid and in the capillaries that are going to help things to move back and forth like they need to um, throughout the capillary area. So this would be the capillary area in here, the capillary bed. So let's talk about um, these pressures. So there's going to be two pressures that are going to promote filtration. Remember, filtration is the movement from capillaries to interstitial fluid. And then there's going to be two other pressures that are going to um, promote reabsorption. And again, reabsorption is moving in the opposite direction from interstitial fluid to capillaries. The two pressures that promote filtration are referred to as blood hydrostatic pressure, abbreviated BHP, and interstitial fluid osmotic pressure, abbreviated IFOP. When I talk about these in more detail, I will be using the abbreviation, so you may want to take a note as to what these abbreviations mean. There's also two pressures that promote reabsorption. Remember, reabsorption is from the interstitial fluid going back into the capillaries. And those two pressures are blood colloid osmotic pressure, or BCOP, and interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure, or IFHP. Let's talk about these in more detail, where they're found, why they're found there, and how they're going to help promote either filtration or reabsorption. Again, I'm going to be uh, writing down the abbreviations. I'll be saying the names, but if you want to take note of that, go ahead and do so. When blood comes into the tissues through the arterial side, blood hydrostatic pressure is going to be its greatest. This is also what is known as blood pressure itself, and that is going to be generated by the pumping action of the heart. And as this pressure comes into this area, it's going to push fluid out of the capillaries and into interstitial fluid. So the higher your blood pressure is, the higher this pressure actually will be and will push even more fluid out of these areas. At this point, Interstitial fluid osmotic pressure, which is found in the interstitial fluid itself, is going to pull fluid out of the capillaries and into the interstitial area. And this is going to be formed, this pressure is made by the protein and substances that are actually in the interstitial fluid. So as blood hydrostatic pressure from within the capillary pushes fluid out, interstitial fluid osmotic pressure is helping to pull fluid out. So it's going to help bring these things out so that nutrient and oxygen can be delivered into the interstitial um, area. As fluid moves out of the capillaries, we're going to generate some more pressure within um, the capillaries themselves. And we're going to have blood colloid 
osmotic pressure within the capillaries that's going to pull fluid from the interstitial space back into the capillaries. Now, blood colloid osmotic pressure is going to be generated by the large proteins that are found in the blood plasma itself. And since fluid has been pushed out of the capillaries initially, there's going to be more proteins and stuff now in the blood plasma to increase this pressure to help on the flip side, pull this fluid back into the capillaries. Another pressure that's going to happen um, on the interstitial side is the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure. Because so much fluid came into the interstitial space, that pressure is going to increase and that pressure is going to actually help push that fluid back into the capillaries. Now these are going to be working together to help substances come out of the capillaries to drop off nutrients and oxygen, and then bring this stuff back into um, the capillaries to go back to the heart. About 85% of the fluid that leaves the capillaries comes back into the capillaries and 15% will stay in that interstitial fluid area that will eventually be picked up by the lymphatic system. We can sum this up by looking at net filtration pressure. Net filtration pressure is going to equal the blood hydrostatic pressure plus the interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. These are, are our filtration pressures. So these are our filtration pressures minus our blood colloid osmotic pressure plus our interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure, which are the um, reabsorption pressures. So reabsorption pressures. So that would give us our net filtration pressure. Net filtration pressure can change depending on where you are in the capillary bed. If you're closer to the arterial side, you're gonna have a positive number, which is gonna indicate that filtration is happening, where if you're on the venous side, you would have a negative number, which would indicate that reabsorption is happening. Thank you so much for watching my video. I hope that you've been finding my videos helpful and informative. If you have any questions or comments, please make sure to put them down below or if you have any ideas for topics of videos that you may want to see in the future, go ahead and put those down below as well. I hope that these videos have been um, helping to educate you better, uh, getting to understand more about how the body works, perhaps helping you with classes that you're studying for, or even just getting you to understand your body even better. Um, I love to hear from my fans. So again, if you have any comments, please make sure to put them down below. If you do like this channel and this video, make sure that you subscribe and click on the notification bell so that you never miss out on a new video. Thank you.